Uh, good morning. Our topic today is the M2 manifestations in uh, the United States. But since this is going to be the basis for uh, next lecture, uh, a prediction, I want to just say a few words in advance about what kind of prediction my theory makes and what kind it doesn't. Uh, I can make only a modal prediction. Now, my thesis is that prediction in regard to a future society is inference to a society's future from its present modal character. And by definition, this can only predict the future mode. Which of the five is going to take over? In other words, it cannot predict the specifics that express it. There are many different concretes, uh, different in a wide range of details. Their agendas, their slogans, their emphases, etc., that all fall <clears throat> within the same mode. For instance, communism and fascism are both M2, but in, in many ways they're different. And very often you will find in a country subgroups of the same mode who do not recognize that another group is their modal ally, who regard each other as uh, um, enemies. This is just what you saw, for instance, in the communists versus the Nazis uh, in Germany. And you see competition among these uh, various groups, ups and downs. One is temporarily dominant. It fades. They merge. They splinter. Now, there's no way that I or anybody can predict given all this, what specific variant will win the struggle? My point, however, is that by definition, the struggles among variants within the same mode don't affect the triumph of that mode, and that every mode has a very definite cultural, political nature uh, implicit in it. And the different forms of that uh, nature do not make much, if any, difference to the people uh, involved. Uh, if you instill the same fundamentals in people's uh, minds, even if the differences uh, between you and some other uh, advocates are dramatic and striking, you're going to still, if one wins, have the same uh, society uh, uh, in essence. Um, we could put it, summarize it this way. The new face of the future society can put on hugely different and changing kinds of makeup in the present, but it is still the same face. Now, I want to just reiterate for clarity a point made in the question period that up to a point, uh, men have free will in regard to the future of uh, society. And therefore, it is possible under some circumstances for a seemingly inexorable, unassailable modal extrapolation to be wrong. And uh, I think I gave the example that a solid, uh, in unquestionable prediction in 1200 uh, would have been nullified by the unexpected eruption of Aristotle later uh, in the century. And there are other such cases. Now, by definition, you can't foresee uh, this type of uh, experience. And that's always there. But it does not mean that prediction is therefore futile. Because the truth is that prediction like any uh, rational or scientific discovery, is contextual. All you can say, but it's an important thing, is within a certain context, uh, the facts warrant this uh, conclusion. And the context would include the fact that there is no evidence of a, uh, philosophic, uh, a fundamental philosophic revolution. So then you can conclude that within that known context, <clears throat> uh, 
what the facts you know entail a specific future, and any other alternative, even given free will, is devoid of actual evidence and cannot now be relevant to a uh, prediction based on fact. Now, another thing, it is very difficult to change a fundamental method of thinking. Uh, they're long lived by their nature because people have nothing but the old method by which to use to make uh, the change. And the implication for, of this is that if you're trying to figure out the future mode, it is not necessary continually to update your information about what's going on in society. Now, the data I'm going to give to you today were compiled last year. And in the next year, they will undoubtedly change in many specific ways. And since my prediction spans more than years, they will change very significantly in generations. But I'm judging by the present, most of such changes will be irrelevant. For instance, I give you the number of millions, say, who attend Catholic Mass today versus uh, the number who convert to baptism. That, that does not uh, affect one way or the other our point. Or oh, take those who reject Christianity, uh, quite a number of people for Ouija boards as their key to uh, the supernatural. That does not affect uh, modal uh, analysis. So please don't write me off as one year behind the times because I'm never going to research this again. And 10 years from now, it'll be in print, and I don't care. If by that time, there's really evidence of a brand new philosophy, I'm happy to throw the book out. <coughs> uh, now, I always forget to turn that on. Our topic today is the anti-secular rebellion current in America. And that is the, the prominent representatives of the end to mentality. And needless to say, I think you know the largest, the most articulate, the most militant group of M2 rebels are to be found among, and they're called and classified different ways, the fundamentalists, the evangelicals, the Pentecostals, the born again. I call all these collectively the new Christians, capital N. New because of the consistency of their ideology and the scale of their cultural ambitions in its behalf. That has not been seen in the West for many centuries. Now, this is the last time I'm going to say this. I am not saying that if a, a, an M2 US comes, it will necessarily be ruled by Christians, old or new. I have no way to discover whether the mega churches today are going to swallow all of California or are going to, you know, fade away and be replaced. But the influence of this movement, if it exists, enables us to do something more broad and something more enduring, to find out what is the extent of the M2 penetration the M2 penetration today in the U.S. In other words, whether the American public is receptive to a change to M2 in his basic method of thought. And if it is thus receptive today, it will be so indefinitely, so long as there is no modal or fundamental philosophic opposition to it. So let's ask to what extent has M2 penetrated the U.S. culture? I have lots of facts and figures, but since they're going to be outdated anyway, I'll give you just a taste. You can read the book for more. Let's take our subjects, literature. There are not many serious new Christian literary works today. There is no Dante, but there are many new Christian novels 
read by many enthusiastic admirers. The outstanding one in the last little while has been the Left Behind uh, series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, uh, which depicts the second coming of Christ, including the rapture, the tribulation, and um, Armageddon. Now, I haven't read the full one, that's beyond me, but from what I can tell, action in these stories is the prerogative of Jesus or the devil, who are presented in essence, not as individuals, but as the abstractions of love, anger, or evil, in relation to which men are pawns. And these pawns do not pursue personal goals because they regard the natural world as unknowable, ruled as it is by unpredictable miracles, and above all, because the good men have no interest in earthly values. So there is no sequence of human events, little characterization. It's primarily a contest of abstract human collectives. It's the godly slash obedient, and then there's the bad people, the secular slash arrogant. Rather than characters, whether classicist, romantic, or natural, rather than characters enacting a progression of events, we have a didactic thriller, a popularization of biblical tales replete with bloodthirsty vengeance against unbelievers. And of course, beneath the surface blood and vengeance is the message. And in this work, the message, since there's almost no characters and no action, the message is everything. Now, it's very obvious the modal comparison to the fiction and fury of the communist uh, literature. Now, I don't want to disparage them improperly. The new Christian readers uh, do not want or only biblical reenactments. They have no beef against many of the classics or the current genre novels. But what they want most of all in their literature is some type of meaning, which to them requires some kind of message which affirms religion. And they are most vocal about wanting this, not so much in literature, but in regard to the movies. Uh, movies are basically today's popular substitute for books, which not many people read anymore. The thing that gets them most is the sex violence uh, uh, movies uh, of Hollywood. And in order to, uh, uh, their idea of an opposition to this, we must have moral values in our literature. And that means to them religious values, which are the only pre uh, protection against the corruption now rampant in American art. And it's rampant because it throws off God, because it is secular. And you know Dostoevsky's line, he isn't a modern Pentecostal, but his famous line, which they all accept totally, if there were no God, anything would be permitted. And the modern idea of these M2s is that's exactly what's happening. Anything is permitted in our society because they don't acknowledge God. Now, the last time I checked, the Left Behind series had sold 60, 60 million copies in print, video, and cassette form. Apparently, in all time, it's been outsold only by Harry Potter. Um, and here's a, a, a brief quote from uh, Lynn Garrett, a religion editor at Publishers Weekly. She says, quote, They've broken out of the Christian ghetto and into the mainstream. It's one of the most profound changes in American publishing in the past decade. You might also remember Mel Gibson's Jesus movie and the fervor of the countless millions who saw it over and over. Now, we don't do science in this uh, excerpted course, but it's so eloquent, I'm just going to give it two sentences. 
Like the other M2s of the past, uh, these uh, moderns attack science as such because it is inherently empirical and uh, secular. In other words, it spurns faith in order to study the unreal. So it's, a, it's a, uh, invalid by its nature. Now, of course, they can sometimes take a scientific theory out of context and say, you see, even science proves uh, what we believe. But mostly they accept, reject, or rewrite science pragmatically according to the effect on their creeds and spread, which is, of course, what the uh, uh, communists did. And here are some of the things that these people believe to show what their attitude to science is, many of which, by the way, are believed by Sarah Palin. The Bible, they commonly hold, proves that the universe is only 6,000 years old. Dinosaurs and men lived happily together before original sin. A abortion can cause breast cancer. I mean, I don't have time for more. In other words, like Kant, like Marx, they hold that it is impossible for real facts to contradict the a priori, you know, the Bible, because God is the creator of facts, just as our category were the creator of facts uh, for Kant or the dialectic uh, for Marx. So any alleged empirical scientific evidence against Christianity must be fantasies or lies. And therefore, in their view, there are no external facts except there's what's dictated by the Bible. Any other kind of facts are a product, or facts in general are a product of ideology. And we have the true a priori, ours are the facts. And as one commentator sums up, these people are, quote, undermining the very idea of empirical reality. And that is really the essence of their metaphysics, which is the essence of pure Platonism. Now, th these people argue well within the framework of what's available. They don't just spout off. And they counter this kind of criticism by saying, where has science's empirical observation led us? Scientists themselves, they point out correctly, tell us that by the use of their vaunted method, they have found that the physical world is unintelligible. They have found, they say, that even their own surface observations are uncertain. They tell us regularly that the whole enterprise of science rests on faith and that it has no more rational basis than that of any other faith. So they go on to say, if faith is what we have to have, and yet you cling to reason, which faith should you adopt? The one which seems to advocate contradictions, like the incarnation and the resurrection, for example, but which holds that these truths will ultimately uh, be understood. In other words, religion, or a faith like quantum mechanics, which doesn't even give you the hope that in another life uh, you will make sense of it. Uh, uh, I mean, you may conceivably, they, they say, grasp the resurrection, but can you ever grasp Schrodinger's cat? Uh, um, isn't it better, they say, to have a real conviction expressing faith in a reality with a meaning which, when we contact it, will reveal to us the source of values, answer our questions, provide happiness? Um, they think that's unanswerable, and they can point to many famous scientists who, who affirm and echo that statement that science is inadequate to satisfy the needs of man and themselves when they leave the laboratory. Well, take an example of that very Schrodinger, a real oriental mystic and proud of it. Uh, you, you have to sum up the picture today as this. Religion 
like in the Enlightenment, was on the defensive in the face of a proudly self-assertive science. And now it certainly seems the opposite uh, is true. Now let's look at education. I start with a quote. Between one and two million American students are now taught in home schools. Some 90% of these, while offering traditional subject matter, define their fundamental educational purpose as religious training. Unquote. Now, if you want to get an idea, you go to one of the conventions of these educators. Here's an example. You get an idea of what content they teach. Here's the example. In this convention, you had all kinds of booths selling, and I'm quoting, Christian curriculum, videos, and educational games for students of every age. Great piles of Bible-themed coloring books and creationist science textbooks. Instruction manuals for raising chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E, submissive girls. Dense scholarly tomes of history interpreted biblically, etc. And one uh, Christian foundation, the Castleton <clears throat> Foundation, explains if Jesus Christ is Lord of the family, he is also Lord of the laboratory. Now, in method of teaching, just as in content, these schools are guided by the same purpose and ideology. Uh, James Dobson is no longer, I think, a highly reputable leader, but he was once a leader, and he still followed his content, advises parents to teach their children total, unquestioning obedience, quote, obedience to what your mother and I, the father, have said, and more important, what we read in God's word, unquote. And I really recommend you look at a book by him called The Strong-Willed Child, and read the part about what the child is supposed to be taught from an eclipse, you can't beat that for anything bad. And But again, the parents come back and they say, oh yes, independence is all well and good. We don't want zombies. But we've tried the godless public schools for decades. And look at what they turn out. These ignorant, amoral, often drug-addicted kids, isn't it time to try an alternative to this secularist disaster? Not the godless school, but the anti-godless school. Now, in politics, the uh, fundamental principle of uh, the new Christians, which has described frequently as, quote, hugely influential, is called dominionism. Capital D. And this theory holds that the secular authorities in the country must be replaced by men of faith who will refashion American life according to God's teachings. Pat Roberts, and you may have a long time had a TV show. U.S. civil law, he was one of this movement's originators. U.S. civil law, he holds, must be replaced by biblical law. And then if you say to him, well, what about the founding father's demand for a wall between church and state? The dominionists reply that this interpretation of the Constitution is a lie invented by, quote, secular humanists. America, they say, I'm sure you've heard this, was founded as a Christian country. Uh, the rights proclaimed by the founders had nothing at all to do with protecting unbelief. Jefferson and the others fought to protect men from godless tyrants, not from the teachers of a holy scripture. The, father, the founding fathers cherished freedom of religion, not from it. You say, you're against liberty? Oh, no, liberty is fine if the concept is properly interpreted. And R.J. Rush Dooney, another big man in the movement, explains, I quote from him, <clears throat> The goal must be God's law order, which, in which alone is true liberty. Any other kind is simply an assertion of man's right to be his own God. And that would amount to atheism. It's a denial of God's supremacy. If, and I continue to quote, if men have 
unrestricted free speech and free press, then there is no freedom for truth, unquote. Now, you see from this uh, brief survey that the goal of the new Christians is not just to hype up Sunday attendance. This is a total ideology. And I quote from a commentator, the goal is the takeover of every aspect of public and private life. And he goes on to give as examples, government, science, history, culture, and relationships. Its primary intent is the conquest of America, of men, families, institutions, bureaucracies, courts, and government for the kingdom of Christ. This is clearly totalitarianism. And as with all forms of totalitarianism, the supreme purpose proclaimed by the leadership, the supreme purpose of this Christian theocracy is the spread of the holy ideas and the elimination of opposition to them. There must be, therefore, a thoroughgoing reorientation of the national mind by means of controlling thought. Now, most of the new Christians, of the masses that are so enthusiastic for it, are not yet willing to carry uh, their ideology this far. But they do heartily disapprove of what they see as the only alternative, namely the directionless, unprincipled, secular politicians in Washington with their meaningless, hypocritical, wheeling, dealing, flip-flopping, empty rhetoric, and often their anti-religious bias. So some are starting to wonder, is this freedom? And if it is, is this thing that we call freedom really compatible with morality? They don't all ask that, but they're asking it. In every one of our diagnostic areas, uh, the application of the new Christian ideology has been clearly defined. Advocates exist. And in most cases, the new material is widely accepted uh, by the advocates, while the establishment views are either condemned or often just simply ignored, <clears throat> brushed aside. No one picks up Joyce as they once did Homer and much later Hugo. Nobody acclaims Bohr or even Einstein as they once did Newton. No one embraces our dumbed down schools as they once did the schools of the McGuffey's Reader. And the single exception in politics with the short-lived canonization of Obama, aside from that, which is gone now, nobody admires the leaders in Washington as they once did Washington, Lincoln, or even JFK. I would summarize the popular attitude as this. The American people do not understand what is called art. They do not understand what is called science. Their children do not understand what the schools are teaching. And the politicians, people think, do not understand anything. <clears throat> so it adds up to an historic popular feeling. Something fundamental has gone wrong with the United States. And the only thing that people can see, the only possible fix, is our authentic religion. Religion shorn of secular concessions. What they seek is a revolution across the whole of American culture in the name of a mode which has not ruled here since the time of the Puritans. Now, some people think that this whole new Christian movement is just a provincial uh, movement uh, restricted to, uh, to uneducated, poor uh, Southern whites. 
But you have to remember that this movement is defined in terms of basic principles, not of concrete dogma. And if you do, you will not be surprised to find where this movement has spread. To begin with, it cuts right across denominational lines. It started as Baptist, but now it is across the religious spectrum. From the fringes, the, the Moonies and the Jehovah's Witnesses, to the Mormons, uh, and to the very heart of the non-Protestant establishment, the Catholics. It's estimated now that about one million Mormons and another million Catholics are enthusiastic ad advocates of what was originally Southern <clears throat> radicalism. And not only across denominational lines, but racial and ethnic lines. This is not a white movement anymore, essentially. Uh, again, I have to cut out all the figures, but one observer points out that evangelicalism dominates Afro-American uh, uh, religion. And Hispanic Catholics have been turning to evangelicalism at such a rate, and here I am quoting Andrew Greeley, uh, uh, very knowledgeable about this point, it's been, the Catholics, the Hispanics have been turning to such a rate that it, it has become for the Catholic Church an ecclesiastic failure of unprecedented proportion. The new immigrants come as Catholics, stay for a while, and then move on to the evangelical uh, movement where they, they, uh, they're getting what they want. Now you say, well, what about the Asian Americans? I'll give you just one fact. Uh, Asian Americans comprise over 25% of evangelical college students in New York City. And don't forget here, the very large numbers of American or Muslim fundamentalists, not necessarily terrorists, but just fundamentalists. Clearly, all these ethnic groups, along with the legion of Caucasians, do not all live in shacks in the Mississippi. They're, and they're all over the north, too. I left that part out. You cannot call this movement provincial. Now, how about the idea that uh, it's restricted to uh, <laughs> disillusioned uh, older people? Well, you just look at the popular youth culture around you. And you will see a lot of things. For instance, very large selling teen mags, magazines, that include in the same issue, the complete New Testament, along with advice on dating and acting. Uh, if you're interested in tattoo, there's a Christian tattoo association with 100 parlors across the country. Uh, if you're in the music industry, you'd be interested to know that Christian music outsells classical and jazz combined. If you're interested in miniature golf, you can go to miniature golf courses with a structure that the first hole is the creation and you go right through to the resurrection at the 18th. <clears throat> I mean, that's just a, a touch. If you think this is not made popular to the young. But let's turn to more obviously significant. Instead of children at play, adults at work. Now, out of the many national institutions essential to our society, I'm going to pick three because each of them has, or, or at least not long ago, had the reputation of being non-religious or even anti-religious. And I'm picking as the three, the, our colleges, our military, and our political parties. Now, college. Since most college professors are, or until recently were, unbelievers, it was long thought that college is a threat to religion. And you know, that's why there's been a steady rise since 1900 of religious colleges, uh, which now enroll one in 10 uh, American college students. And don't think that these students study just uh, theology uh, or, or at all theology. 
They study all the standard cultural and professional fields and then go out and practice in it. But the much more interesting fact is to look at the secular colleges now. And I mean, you know, from a teacher's college uh, off in the wilds on through Harvard. Uh, here's a, uh, one study, quote, a 2004 Harvard Institute of Politics poll found that 35% of college students, 35% call themselves born again, and 22% identify as evangelical or fundamentalist Christian. Now, you know Jack Dorita, he was one of these big modern symbolist phonies, very big in the college. So they asked Stanley Fish, a very famous commentator, uh, who, who gives us a report as follows. He says, Fish, I was called by a reporter who wanted to know, when Dorita died, who wanted to know what would succeed the triumvirate of race, gender, and class as the center of intellectual energy in the academy. And he goes on, Fish, I answered like a shot, religion. Announce a course with religion in the title and you will have an overflow of population. Unquote. Now, for some people, of course, it's a fad. But according to a UCLA survey, quote, more than 70% of students said they pray, discuss religion or spirituality with friends, find religion purpose, uh, personally helpful, and gain spiritual strength by trusting in a higher power. Uh, here's another quote from a 20-year-old college girl. My generation is discontent with dead religion. We don't want to show up on Sunday, sing two hymns, hear a sermon, and go home. The Bible says we're supposed to die. Unquote. And, and then another girl, one more, I, I just can't resist. Uh, she's quoted in the New York Times probably. Explains that students need, quote, something more spiritually meaty than they've had. And then she offers, in my opinion, the absolutely best definition of the whole M2 movement, if you know how to interpret it. She says, quote, people don't want Christian light. You know, L-I-T-E, like beer, light. Uh, Christian light is Christianity, God, diluted by worldliness. Uh, faith polluted by science. In effect, it's the long outdated M1. Uh, they want real Christianity the way it was in the medieval period. And, and the manifestations of this, you know about the booming business of praise and worship music? Well, it's, it's a, the, you, the music is played in college auditorium, filled with rap students on their feet. And as one of them puts it, quote, we are directly connecting to God one on one, unquote. And therefore, they're, de they're de developing uh, their, the meaning of life uh, by working on the non-materialistic side of their nature. And then if you, you know, try to argue, they say, what do our secular courses offer us? A bunch of assorted facts, random theory, resting on a pile of authorities, with the professor stressing that all of it is value-free, that none of it is certain, and that most of it is the expression of race, class, or gender prejudice anyway. So what good is it? What kind of meaning do we get from all that? That's college. Let's just take a quick look at the military. Uh, the military has been staunchly Christian. Uh, for quite a while, but always stayed away publicly from religious talk uh, because whatever their personal opinions, they thought it was essential to be seen as professionals, you know, and were recognizing the soldier's religion is irrelevant to his function. But that is not the picture now. 
ranking officers commonly now state that the United States is a Christian nation and that soldiers are God's warriors. Now, I want to quote you from a statement in the official newspaper of the Air Force Academy. Now, the Air Force is the most religious of the military branches, but certainly not the only. And it's been hushed up a little bit recently because they antagonized too many people. It was too much anti-Semitism. Um, so they're, they're, they're a little embarrassed about it, but it's there, believe me, because I had a lot of commerce with the people in the Air Force Academy. I happened to live near them. Uh, the big thing on that, uh, I have no time, is, is the chapel. But anyway, the official newspaper of the Air Force Academy ran as proclaiming, quote, that Jesus Christ is the only real hope for the world. Unquote. Now you say probably just a few lunatics signed this, right? And the ads, quote, were signed by 160 department heads, nine permanent professors, both the incoming and outgoing deans of faculty, the athletic directors, and more than 200 academy senior officers and spouses. Unquote. Now, I won't go through the other branch, uh, branches, except to say that the army, according to one source, contains, quote, a movement dominated by these Christian dominionists, and they claim that it makes up between 20 and 30 percent of army members. I have some real stories about the Department of Defense, too. I'm going to cut them out. Again, what is the argument of these people? If we don't have faith, we don't have the motive or the inner strength to go to war. How can you expect us to risk our lives for a country we love while saying that God is irrelevant, our thoughts are non-absolute, our actions are amoral, and our patriotism is merely a subjective feeling no more valid than the feelings of any other country? Now, I don't survey businessmen in this study, but for what it's worth, I quote a sentence I recently read in a book, Sympathetic to Christianity. I don't know whether it's true. Quote, America's executive class, the CEO, is probably its second most religious elite in the country after the senior military. Unquote. Now, I want to look at political parties. Now, I don't even bother talking about the Republicans. You must know by what I've written in the past that I agree entirely with the commentator who describes the Republicans at this point as, quote, the first religious party in U.S. history, unquote. But much more revealing is the Democrats, uh, who always regarded the separation of church and state as constitutionally mandated and whose concern was always essentially with the secular economic issues. Now, of course, they still are as you can see, uh, concerned with all kinds of uh, economic and material issues. But what's interesting is that many in the party are urging a soft peddling of secularism and a new stress on religion. As one observer puts it, Democrats, as well as Republicans, are repeatedly invoking religion to justify uh, their actions. Some uh, of the Democratic leadership, I think, are sincere in this faith. But I think it's doubtful that you could turn around a party of today's politicians primarily by intellectual or spiritual means. I can see college students, I can see military men turning to God in the quest for meaning. But I think in all likelihood the Democrats and even most Republicans are after not meaning, but votes. Uh, the Republicans, the Democratic Party is starting to think have an unfair advantage owing to their, and what Democrats call their, quote, arrogant monopoly on faith, unquote. And here is a very eloquent recent book by Amy Sullivan, a firm Baptist and Democrat, a book that's 
I believe widely read in, in the party, and she states the task ahead for Democrats as she sees it, and it's great to state exactly what's going on in the Democratic Party. And this is the title and subtitle. The Party Faithful, How and Why the Democrats Are Closing the God Gap. They're moving up to catch up with the Republicans. Now, that secular politicians become authentic believers, if that were true, it would be in of, of itself eloquent. But, but that their thinking of wearing a religious mantle pragmatically, because otherwise they're going to lose elections, I think that's a lot more eloquent sign because it tells us not just about Washington, but about the mainstream in the country. Uh, I, I just can't omit the following. It, it's just too much. One more example of the Democrats, and this occurred in one of the party's official publicized forums. And here's a description, a guy named uh, Vanderslice. Uh, the young Democrats in attendance, the young Democrats in attendance, quote, were beaming. Who would have thought, he's really just getting time, who would have thought, Vanderslice asked, looking up at the bright television lights on the stage and the enormous banners, the banners lit up on the Democratic Forum stage labeled faith, values, and poverty. Three years ago, who would have thought, unquote. Now, when the quasi-Marxist party whose whole concern is the redistribution of wealth, and very, very active, obviously, in this, takes a pause to salute the banner of poverty. You have to say something has happened. Now, <clears throat> before we draw conclusions from all this, we, we should note that there is contrary, or seemingly contrary, evidence. I'll give it to you from the mouth of one alarmed conservative. Quote, the number of people who claim no religious affiliation has doubled since 1900. Non-believers now represent the third highest group of Americans after Catholics and Baptists. The number of Christians has declined 12% since 1990 and is now only 76% the lowest percentage in American history. And I could regale you with a lot of quotes like that. Facts such as the above, I think, do represent some degree of popular recoil from religion, or certainly at least from organized religion. Because uh, I think in part of the emptiness of the traditional mainline schools, and the sometimes scary or even lunatic zealotry uh, of the new. But I don't think there's any basis to believe that this recoil involves a change in fundamentals, uh, involves a rejection of supernaturalism as such. Only about 1% of the American public are atheists or agnostics, and that's a figure which has not changed for generations. And even in these cases, the mode of operating is often unclear. An atheist does not have to be an I or even a D. Uh, atheism just says there's no God, but it leaves open the possibility of all the non-theistic forms of supernaturalism, from magic to Marxism while agnosticism it goes so far as to say that even the Christian God himself is possible that we just don't know. Uh, and, you know, by that fact, they remove themselves from any dim classification. They don't know what to believe. As to the unaffiliated believers, which is the biggest number, they don't belong to any church, they're not atheists, they're not agnostics, the great majority, from what I can find out, accept their faith with as little doubt as their church-going kin. In fact, almost a third of the people 
who call them, who are classified as, as uh, non-religious pray, while one in 10 still believes that Jesus is the son of God. So you have to take under uh, advisement these figures. On top of which, uh, there's a new breed of quasi-religious non-Christians, and as you'd expect, especially on the two coasts, uh, above all on the eastern seaboard, and they've dropped the god of old in favor of paranormal beliefs. And they're more paranormal oriented by far than uh, the south. I think that most of today's so-called unbelievers still believe. They don't want conventional religion, but they don't even think uh, to challenge its essence. And those who do just throw up their hands as hopeless uh, and walk away. And irreligion in the form of paranormal is no problem for a, an MT uh, movement. Now, let me estimate, um, as I did for the other movements, what is the size of the new Christian religion? Size doesn't tell the whole story, but part of it. Now, the estimates of the size of the Protestant congregations involved in this movement vary widely, depending largely on the researcher's definition of what you have to believe uh, to qualify. But even the dispute is instructive. The most restrictive counters who minimize the number and say, let's not make too much a fuss of it, say that 60 million are committed. On the other extreme, the more generous go to 120 million. So if you just took an average, it would be about one third of the US population, about, say 90 million. Now, uh, all the other Christians who belong to the mainline churches, uh, who don't like the evangelicals but have no opposition and agree that God and so on is crucial are not, uh, are not a problem there. So the numbers in terms of uh, possibilities are, are, are even greater. Let me, let me give you one more recent study here. <clears throat> now, this is not of evangelicals, but of Christians in general, wh wherever they come from. 55% said that they regard the Bible as literally accurate. The Bible, all of it from seven days on. 64% believe that God parted the Red Sea for Moses. 80% believe in the day of judgment. If you add all these figures up and divide, it, it comes to something like 47% of Americans, or, or at least a large, large part of them, now actually hold or sympathize with a pre-enlightenment and even a pre-modern quasi medieval view of the world. Uh, now my figures may be off, by tens of millions. And Christianity may soon become outdated, although I don't believe either of those, but might. But I think the one solid conclusion that emerges is that judging by present evidence, including the lack of philosophic opposition, M2 goes far and is here to stay. All right, now I'm going to turn to a related issue. It's possible for a society to accept the fundamentals of a new mode and yet in some ways be unknowingly inconsistent with it. And this would be a major problem to the leadership of a growing mode. And there is just such an obstacle facing the M2s today. <clears throat> the only real obstacle, and that is the lure of this world. Millions have become convinced that nature is not really reality, that it's not really intelligible, that it's irrelevant to values. 
But all the people, most of the people who say that, especially in America, still are enamored of material goods. Homes, cars, computers, jets, the believers strongly desire them, including the new Christians, with no idea that such desire involves ideological issues. A consistent and reliable flock of the faithful, as the medievals knew, must destroy the desire for such objects. If you're going to be explicitly otherworldly and not the pretense of the, of the Marxists, you simply cannot take over if men are in love with the things of this world. Now, you have to destroy a certain kind of passion. And to destroy means tear apart, disintegrate what leads to it. And that applies to value issues just as much as we saw in regard to metaphysics and epistemology. And if destruction is what you want, you know that you can get a lot of help from the experts in disintegration, and particularly in those who specialize in uh, destruction, the D2s. So it might be the case that the D2s come in here and are a real ally. So let's see. Our world was transformed by two events, which were the real sources and embodiments, the existential sources and embodiments of what we call materialism. The American Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. The American Revolution, you know, recognized the rights of the individual, enshrined man's worldly life, told him to go out and achieve material property, which was his. <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution applied science to life and therefore made possible an abundance of material wealth unprecedented, impossible even to be wished for earlier because inconceivable. And the result of this combination was the materialist outlook. And it was these two pillars of secularism that the aspiring new Christians have to bring down. We have to turn off or turn back the Industrial Revolution. Now, we don't have to worry much about the Founding Fathers anymore because we see that that system is already, the way it stands, moving ever near to its own uh, destruction. I'm not saying it can't be stopped, but it's not a big obstacle right now to a potential totalitarian. Not the way the, uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution and the lifestyle uh, that it made possible. I think that's the supreme obstacle. Now, of course, any evolution, uh, uh, other worldly philosophy, as such as, for instance, the medievals have the same problem. How to squelch, the, in their case, the pagans' desire for material good. But in those days, there was comparatively little wealth. It was a much less formidable problem and gradually gave away before philosophic and moral admonition. But today, if you want to destroy man's love of material goods, you have to have a concrete, powerful, modern-sounding stimulus. Uh, it's not enough to preach poverty. You have to find the proof that will be convincing to people today of anti-material. And today's uh, M2 leaders have said, we found it. The proof is not only in the Bible, but in the thing that everybody thought was its nemesis, and as now its exponents are proving that we are right. Scientists themselves are showing in irrefutable terms that evils wrought by man's production and consumption of wealth and the necessity of sharply cutting it back, curtailing it. Now, the M2s are antagonistic, as we've seen to science, but they're prepared to use it when helpful, relying on such prestige as it still has. And the science they discover is the D2 version of nihilism, environmentalism. The new trend today among the M2s is green Christianity. 
That's what they call it. During a recent Earth Day service, the National Council of Churches, which claims to represent 50 million Americans, addressed a prayer to the heaven. Quote, God of mercy, we confess that we are damaging the earth, the home that you have given us. We buy and use products that pollute, unquote, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, they, they point out, this is nothing new. It's all in Deuteronomy. And this is an actual quote from Deuteronomy. Do not cut down trees, even to prevent ambush, or build siege engines. Do not bottle waters or burn crops, even to cause an enemy's submission, unquote. Now, it wasn't so long ago under the so-called Protestant ethics that the people who, quote, damaged the earth and cut the trees were praised. <clears throat> they were told by the Christians that that's going to get you into heaven, but not anymore. Especially not by the newest ones, uh, because, uh, as one observer puts it, on this issue, there has been, quote, a generational change. The older leaders were suspicious of environmentalism, but the newer ones are gun hopeful. And many religious leaders, I should add, now accept environmentalist doctrines genuinely, not just as strategy. Because they say nature as God's creation, material sacrifice as man's duty, Spiritual, not material fulfillment as his goal. What else is religion? And as one such person puts it, who can call himself a believer in God, the designer, if his design is being clear cut, paved over, or rendered extinct by the fir tree? So it's God's design or man's desecration of it. The medievals held the human initiative. Uh, material innovation, or a rebellion against God's plan, sure to end in disaster in the form of the unendurable heat of hell. The D2 assistance today asks that we, quote, let it be, unquote, because otherwise we will end in disaster in the form of the unendurable heat of global warming. God won't tolerate worldly achievement, said the one. Nature won't, said the second. And nature comes from God. It's the same program. This is another among many reasons why the alleged dichotomy between the right and the left is actually disappearing. Because the right now also believes in the need for more government, not only to support their traditional religious causes, but also the ever-widening programs of the Greens. <clears throat> now, it's a question how much the American public buys the environmentalist gospel. And I think you, you, the polls are mixed, but whatever the polls say, I think two facts are clear. Very few people voice intellectual, basic opposition to environmentalism. And as a result, there is widespread, uncomplaining national compliance with concrete environmentalist demands that continually remove physical enjoyment from people's lives. And these are demands and policies that just 50 years ago would have provoked howls of incredulity. <clears throat> I mean, I don't have to tell you, deliberately inflated gas prices, toilets that don't flush, weekly forays to sort your garbage, the banning of nuclear power, coal power, of expanded highways, of dams because of a spotted ant, or owl, whatever it is, etc. And of course, business and professional groups, always very courageous, hurry to jump on the bandwagon and boast of how green they are. Now, you might say, well, do, all, do they all really believe it? I think the answer the M2s would give is it doesn't make any difference. They don't expect their mass base to turn into saints. What matters to them is the ideology of material wealth as evil. 
And <clears throat> once people accept this as the morally required viewpoint, they're no longer an obstacle. Let them cheat and sin as much as they want. That is no threat to the authorities because these sinners define themselves as guilty and therefore they go underground and stay quiet as happened throughout the whole medieval period. Now, I just want to repeat, like any concrete under a broad abstraction, the whole environmentalist movement might prove ephemeral. And it's had some big body blows uh, recently. Although it might be renewed when Gore dies from sheer joy. <clears throat> but even if uh, the environmentalist movement does fade out, that is not going to be a problem as long <clears throat> as the M2s can count on some other form of nihilism that works to destroy uh, production and material wealth under the guise of some uh, secular scientific justification. And, you know, the nihilists are all over the place today. I don't think they have a big problem finding helpful uh, uh, M2s, helpful DJ. Now, I should say just in passing here that the philosophic connection between environmentalists and Christians is increasingly recognized not only by Christians, but by environmentalists themselves who are trying to work the alliance in the opposite direction. In other words, to use religion to foster <coughs> their nihilist goals. And a number of them are saying, we found out that people will simply not sacrifice to nature if we put nature up as an end in itself. In other words, they won't just destroy for the sake of destroying. We can't get them to become D2s, but they will carry out our program if they believe that nature is the handiwork of God and that their sacrifice is a divine requirement. And this has given rise to what is called, quote, religious environments. Uh, and I quote from one of them. <clears throat> we must always remember, quote, the unique gifts religion offers to help us, unquote. So there are the green Christians and the Christian greens. Now, I think uh, a lot of these are just uh, strategy. You know, pragmatists trying to expand their base. But it doesn't make any difference because either way, they're proselytizing. They're pushing the ideas that the M2s require. And it's a huge boast to this kind of M2 movement that is right in the mainstream. No one can say, this is some kind of weird, uh, you know, southern uh, fringe movement or, or right-wing uh, extremism. Uh, you know, when Jesus was born, it was still considered ridiculous to preach poverty, uh, as the early Christians did. But today, it's becoming the fashion, and we're told it's a necessity. Now, the M2D2 or putting it more broadly, the M2D alliance is now a cultural reality. Now that alliance does not blur the distinction between the opposed modes. <clears throat> the D2 effort to destroy is welcomed by uh, modern M2s only when the object being destroyed, only when the value being destroyed is an obstacle <clears throat> to their own the transcendent cause. The D2s want to destroy all values. The M2s destroy selectively, simply as a means to man's ultimate reward. They don't want to annihilate a man, but only wicked passions that he holds. So I would summarize it this way, because don't confuse a coalition with a, an identity. The D2s want to kill human desires because they are desire. The M2s because they are the wrong desire. Uh, and that's why you, you will see that what, what was seen in, uh, in the 20th century. Once M2s get to power, however use they make of D2s first, they have no further use of D2s. They want total obedience, not nihilists, and they completely wipe out the D2s, which is just what Hitler and Lenin did. <clears throat> I can sum up now. 
each side of the M2-D2 alliance believes that it's working to defeat the other and to achieve its own goals. But when you review every case, well, I won't say what conclusion I come to until next time. I'll give you just one of the best sentences, if I say so myself unblushingly, in my whole book. If there was three or four like this, I'd publish it. The haters of God are a godsend to his lovers. Thank you. Now, the only thing I can, I'll apologize in advance, the next lecture is more pessimistic than this one. <laughs> Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Peacock. You've pointed out that Western civilization has been dominated by the M mode. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like to explain well, why I that is? I never did. <clears throat> You're right. If you look at that total uh, chart that I gave you uh, of the whole history and count up the years, you will see that M in some form has covered over 2,000 years and that the I's and the D's together less than 500, something like a quarter. And this is after the discovery of, uh, by the Greeks of uh, uh, reason and science. I think this has a meaning and an implication. I might just comment on it here. Four of the modes could only have been developed in or after Greece. There was nothing earlier to parallel or anticipate. Because before the mind and the reason had been discovered, you couldn't have had science, there'd be no I. You couldn't have had any attempt to integrate it uh, uh, with uh, religion. And you certainly couldn't have had any rebellion against it. So all the modes except one had to start only with the Greeks. But M2, now I repeat what I said in a question period recently. There was no M2 before Greece considered as a philosophy. There was only, I've, I've already elaborated that, only concrete emotions, inarticulate tendencies, uh, unexplained practices, etc. But I do think it's fair to say that there was a, that kind of primitive supernaturalism and, and the demand for authority to mount it to faith, a primitive anticipation of, of uh, M2 going all the way back uh, to prehistory. And that that was a real factor in men's lives insofar as ideas, as opposed to just direct perception, could have been a factor. I would certainly not say it's Platonism. It was not religion in the Western sense, and it's most certainly not Aristotle, but it's something, and it's something significant. Now, why? Why, as far as we can trace all the way back, was it, let's call it religion, some kind of religiosity, nothing else uh, before the Greek. And it's, I don't think my viewpoint is uh, original here, but <clears throat> I think that that some version of supernaturalism was historically unavoidable, that man could not have started or developed any other way, that that was inherent in the fact of man confronting the world in a totally primitive, ignorant state. So he couldn't, as man yet, survive, he couldn't survive by just perception. He wasn't an animal with this automatic built into him, he had to somehow on some level, if he's to the extent that he's man qua man, use his conceptual faculty. But he had no idea that such existed or how to use it or that he was doing anything to come up with his conclusions. So you could project various possibilities, but I think it's obvious that the one thing impossible to him at that stage would be science. Um, uh, and uh, reason, objectivity. That would be, you know, uh, like expecting him to fly to the moon. <clears throat> so I would put it in this way. 
the default setting of the mind at the start is some version of non-reason. Now, I'm not saying that that's Kantian. That's not anti-reason. It's just they don't know what it is and they can't exercise. And then, of course, the result of that has to be the lack of self-esteem, uh, you know, that it makes it even harder. And that went on for millennia. So I don't think all modes are created equal. Um, I think that the dominance of M, even after the Greeks, is a suggestion that that kind of fundamental approach has been so entrenched in the mind of our species that we have never truly escaped it. Uh, we have remained in some form God-oriented, in part or in whole, almost without exception since uh, the origin of the species. Even the I periods maintained a background belief uh, in uh, the supernatural. So it seems that mankind, and even its best Western representatives, is still frighteningly close to uh, its primitive roots. And you know perhaps Ayn Rand's statement in this regard, when people are surprised at this kind of phenomenon, she says, it is earlier than you think. And we pride ourselves with the heritage of you know, logic and science and the Industrial Revolution, but does that have a foundation in the, in the Western man? If you look at the spectacle to prehistory and you look at what's happening in the best country in the world today, it gives you pause. That's it. The next question. Yes. Uh, given the weak influence of the D1s and the... A little louder, please. Given the, weak, given the weak cultural influence of the D1s, the yes. scattershot approach of the D2s, and the more uh, serious focus of the M2s, don't you think that with this, fuse, uh, this uh, fusion of uh, environmentalism and religion, the fusion of the, the Ds and the M2s, will ultimately lead to the M2s throwing off the environmentalist trappings? That they're, they're yeah, probably, because they don't care one way or the other about nature. So uh, in the end, uh, uh, they will just throw that aside. They don't need it. But it may take a while for that to happen. I was going to move this. OK, on that side. Uh, as we are fighting for, I don't sort know. I can't hear up there. Can anybody hear? As we are fighting for an eye culture, right, or an eye mode, um, is there anything that you can say about the, the sort of speed and uptake of, That's exactly of the one eye? Of the topics. That's one of the topics of next one. <laughs> what do I predict? How fast and how probably? So that'll give you something to look forward. Unless you think I'm already so pessimistic, you want to know. <clears throat> yes. Okay, I'm very interested in the principles of forecasting. Um, oh, well, that's your specialty, so don't hold me to that. So. <laughs> so now, you said at the beginning that uh, using DIM to predict, you use inference I'm about... I'm sorry, I don't know whether... It's, I, in, the sound does not... In come the up. beginning, you said using DIM to forecast. You yeah. said you, you make an inference about the future from the culture's current mode. Yeah. Okay, now when I look at your table of modes, we are in, you categorize, we're in D2. But there's no other D2 in history. So one method of forecasting would be to take historical precedents and use that to forecast. But there is no historical precedent of D2 in any part of history prior to the present. And I'm intrigued by you integrating M's and the D2s today. So, okay. so how, do you, how do you predict the future as darkly as you do when even the darkest past, the Middle Ages, was only preceded by an M? Yeah, okay. It wasn't preceded by a D. Yeah. Um, I actually, I give that in the last lecture, but I'll just hint at it. 
It's a, it's a very good question. <coughs> it bothered me at one point. I'm using all this um, study of history to infer the future from the past, but there was no D2 in the past. So how can I use the past to indicate uh, you know, what's, uh, what's coming? Uh, in the, uh, we know now that M1 go to M2 and D1 go to D2, but there's no case uh, of uh, D2 uh, in the past. What I have to tell you is that, uh, I, I'll go into this more in the last lecture, but it comes down to there is a very big difference by the nature of the theory, uh, the effects of M2 and D2 on a culture. Now, theoretically, as far as I'm my definition is concerned, it could go on indefinitely. There's no intrinsic contradiction. But there's one other thing. Uh, D2 and M2 preach very different things. They're both the end of one road or the other road. But if you go into what they preach, not just the consistency of what they preach, but into the content of <coughs> what they preach, uh, one is, has a very different effect than another. So all you can say is, all I can say as a predictor is, and I don't want to say it yet, but if, if people see a, a choice between two things, and one on its face is, is, can't, uh, can't be lived on, and the other, they strongly believe can be with a long historical precedent, that makes a difference. But where, what history would also say, if there is a, a philosophic force that's new, that can uh, wipe out that prediction. But it'd be better, uh, just think of this for, for next time. There is a country in the 20th century that was an exact D1, D2 country uh, with a large, uh, very strong M2 religious base. And it was, took a very short time to have a, a totalitarian M2 uh, regime uh, that it was completely prepared for and the whole D2 were annihilated. But uh, fast, so fast that people still can't believe that all of the professors and the commentators and the government just went like that. Um, and that's the country that I'm going to give as an example. But I'm not saying, certainly not yet, not today, that that's going to happen. But I think it's a good question. I, I, what I have to do, what I do in the book is show that the, the prediction is, is not simply that one leads to two and two leads to X, is what happens to two is, and I think here we're going to have something happen. Uh, yes, sir. Can you give um, other examples of an M2 philosophy using D2 to further its goals? Well, I think that a, I think the same Christianity can use a good part of the M2 movement to further its goals, whenever what it does is knock down an obstacle, and a lot of worldly obstacles. And, and nihilists want to knock down an obstacle. So now, uh, for instance, uh, suppose uh, they think one way to, uh, to achieve the knockdown you know, of wealth is to knock down the rich. Well, now from that point of view, They'd be allies of the egalitarians. Every time that happens, or Wall Street, that's a cesspool of riches that's no longer uh, you know, uh, in our path. Now, the church or the religion, M2, is not egalitarian. You know, they have a, a hierarchical society uh, in mind. And from the beginning, you help the poor, but the poor don't sit with the pope uh, you know, uh, at the table. So they're certainly not egalitarian. But if you want to use that, you know, to knock somebody down, that that be, is being used today. You don't hear any religious uproar against that. You don't even hear any religious uproar 
against uh, Obama's egalitarianism in foreign policy. And when he goes to, to you know, uh, whatever it is, Siberia or Liberia, wherever he goes and says, we apologize for everything we've ever done. We're the scum of the earth. Please bomb us. No, none of these, none of these patriot religious people stand up. They don't, uh, whatever they say, they're just as anti-American in, in the sense of as a distinct country. So that, that is helpful for them. Of course, they'll become patriots when it's pragmatically necessary. Who else? I have over here, yes. Um, with regard to uh, the M's, I's, and D's, it occurred to me that the difference between M1 and M2 could also perhaps be looked at as a difference of where the misintegration is taking place. Where the what? Misintegration, the M is taking place. The M's for um, M2 is obviously all over the place, but M1, it could seem, or for that matter, D1, with this integration, it would appear could be that they still have some valid integration taking place in epistemology. And I was wondering if you had thought about applying the mode of integration below the level of philosophy to each of the five branches. I'm sorry, I just, I, you said something about that the uh, disintegration in D is in epistemology, but that, that's, I mean, it's an epistemological viewpoint, mm -hmm. but it's in everything. They, it's in their approach uh, to science or to life or to whatever. It's a mode. A mode is not restricted to a field. If it's a mode, it's got to be across the board. So uh, it's not, uh, uh, D1 is only, is only partial disintegration. So you're trying to say what? I was trying to say whether or not the partial was partial across partial all Partial does not mean one field, but not another. Partial yeah. means partial in every field. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, yes. Um, I am Hersey Alley. She recently uh, called on in her new book, Nomad, um, for Christians to reach out to Muslims to try to diffuse Islamic fundamentalism in the, in the United States and Sharia law. Can you comment about how realistic uh, well, Christian... Well, I, I, I don't know, but let, I'd like to get the name of that. Is she getting any response? Um, she had interviews uh, recently where she was talking about that. I don't know what kind of responses she has been getting, but... That's it's an very interesting. interesting. I don't know whether uh, she could get away with that, but I do think that there, I mean, all religions, you know, a, a lot of people with the terrorists are very hot on taking out passages from the Koran and saying how monstrous they are. And I'm prepared to, con to concede that, but uh, modally, there's, there's no difference. You know, and, uh, you know, in the uh, centuries ago, the, the Muslims had a high civilization. And the Christians were barbarians. Uh, so the issue is the common denominator. Now, how many will see it? I don't know. Now, if you ask me, and I'm not a, um, on this, I'm you know, beyond the moral situation. It looks to me, and your own would be a much better commentator on this than me, that the Muslims are generally much more militant, and the Christians are much more I don't know if I could say timorous, but tall for them. And if it, if it came to a war uh, between the two, with the Christians refusing, as they do now, to use any of their weapons, or, you know, just use them like you do in Korea, just, you know, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Muslims won. If I, I would go so far as to say that in United, in uh, Europe, there's very little doubt that the Muslims are going to take over completely. And that, uh, the, because Europe is D, all the way, D2, D1, and does not have a religious uh, indigenous uprising. They pride themselves on being secular. So they're going to have to turn to religion. Uh, they have no even conception. And right now you see the Muslims are moving in everywhere. I, th I think you'll find it. Europe becomes a Muslim continent. And the question is, what do we become uh, as, as a counter to that? But if, if, if they do become a Muslim country, and we, uh, you know, limp on uh, apologetically, 
uh, and, and let's say we just stay for a while in the D category, I would be ripe for them to take over here too. Now, I don't believe that. I mean, I do about Europe, but I don't believe that about here. But I'll tell you my next time. I guess we're out of time. Thank you very much.